All right, it's about 12. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to introduce an outstanding colleague uh, in the physics department, Professor Tan Meng Chuan. All right, I'll just give a uh, short CV, an outstanding CV. And contrary to many people's belief uh, that if you do physics, you have to start young, you'll do a lot of mathematics or whatever. But Professor Tan was originally an engineer. And not only just an engineer, he was a full-time career soldier in the Air Force and rising all the way to be a major. So in other words, he did his PhD part-time in the National University. All right, and this is our own uh, very pr product. And during his PhD, all right, he discovered something very interesting and he wrote to Professor Eaton. And as you know, Professor Eaton is also another interesting character and he's world famous, he's considered uh, one of the leading deities of uh, modern physics, of in particular string theory. And Professor Wheaton is also not a physics graduate or a mathematics graduate, he's actually a history graduate who went on to do journalism and helped to one of the standards to run for some event in America and before he went back to physics. All right. And during uh, uh, Professor Tan's candidature here, as I said, he wrote to Professor Beaton and they have correspondence and they discover something interesting and that went on to complete his PhD uh, around 2007. And then very quickly he was invited by Professor Beaton himself, the director of uh, the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and to become his uh, postdoctoral mentee. And after that he went on to do a second postdoc in California Institute of Technology, Caltech uh, before he returned to Singapore around, around uh, 2010 as an assistant professor. Within a very short time, all right, uh, he published more papers and he was quickly uh, promoted to associate professor. All right. Today, he will give a leisurely introduction to string theory, which uh, if you are not in physics, you may not have some background, but he will uh, be able to bring it down to your level. Uh, he has won several teaching awards too, not just a group. A, uh, important researcher and he will also uh, talk about the future of mathematics, physics and in particular also cosmology and the implications in religion. So let's put our hands together and welcome Professor Tan. First I'd like to thank Phil for the very kind introduction. That said, it was really tough coming from a different field because there was a lot to catch up. I didn't really know what I didn't know, so good and bad. I studied everything because I didn't know what I didn't know. And that was difficult, but as a result, I had a very thorough understanding because I, I was paranoid about what I didn't know. So, well, trade-offs, pros and cons. Uh, anyway, okay, let's continue with our talk today. I'll be giving an introduction to string theory, and I will highlight its pivotal role in mathematics, in the future of mathematics, and that of religion. There'll be no equations whatsoever. It's meant for a general audience. Anybody can understand. Ideas in physics are usually only mathematical when you want to do some kind of bookkeeping to compute something. But the ideas, even in relativity, is something like general relativity, it's, it's all imagination. Okay, so that's what I want to communicate to you, and that's the most important thing. Okay, so the outline of our talk, first, I'll give you a brief review of physics before the 1980s. In other words, physics before string theory. And then I'll give you a reason why we need a unified theory of physics. And then I'll go on to introduce string theory to you, a very leisurely introduction of string theory. No mathematics at all. And then I'll talk about string theory and cosmology, the implications for cosmology from string theory. And then I'll talk about the implications for mathematics from string theory. And finally, last but not least, string theory and its implications on theology and therefore religion. And we would conclude our talk. Okay, physics before the 1980s. Now, in 1687, Newton came up with his theory of gravity. It says that when you have two masses, like this, they always attract with a gravitational force that's given by this. Okay, I'm sorry, just one formula. Okay. <laughs> just one formula. <laughs> okay, so, 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 so this is a formula which involves the masses of the two objects and the distance between them. The point is that the closer you are, the force is greater. That's because this is smaller. Okay, but the point is that the forces act simultaneously, attract each other simultaneously, instantaneously, no matter how far away they are from each other. Okay, so that's the key point. The forces act 
instantaneously. In other words, faster than anything that can travel. Infinitely fast. However, in 1905, from experiments, we know that the speed of light was actually a finite value, 3 times 10, about 8 meters per second. It's not infinitely fast. And that if you were an observer measuring the speed of light, if you're not moving or if you are moving towards light or away from light at a constant speed, you would still measure the speed of light to be 3 times 10, about 8 meters per second. That's very counterintuitive. I mean, if you look at a car that's coming towards you and you run towards a car, and if you measure the speed of a car, it's going to be faster than the speed of a car. It's your speed and the car's speed because you're closing in, right? But this funny thing about light, it doesn't behave in that way. So Einstein said, okay, you know, let's accept that light is such and let's revamp all we know about physics with this uh, postulate of light, this, this, this uh, observation of light. So with that, he developed the special theory of relativity, which gave, rose, gave rise to concepts like time dilation and length contraction. Time dilation is a very interesting concept. It says that if you are here standing and observing someone that's moving in a bus, and if the bus moves past you very, very quickly, you would see that the processes going on in the bus slow down. In other words, what you would see of a man maybe throwing a ball up in the air and catching it, if the bus passes you very quickly, you would see it go up and down very slowly. In other words, time slows down in a moving frame at constant velocity, but very close or some fractions of the speed of light when it's very quickly. Of course, if the bus is moving you like what you would see you know, at the bus stop, this doesn't happen. You don't observe such effects. Okay, so time dilation, right, is one example of this consequence of special theory of relativity. And so, as you can see now, that time flows at a rate which depends on the velocity of the frame. So it's very much like a distance parameter, right? In distance, how fast the rate of change of distance depends on speed. So in that sense, time has become like a distance coordinate or space coordinate. And in that case, space and time were unified into one with the theory of relativity, the special theory of relativity, and that's where we have this idea of, oops, sorry, space-time. Okay? And therefore, in, in, if, you, if mathematically, it would mean that instead of using a graph that's uh, Euclidean, you would use a Mikowskian kind of space, whereby it's a special kind of coordinate which takes into account that time behaves like a spatial coordinate, but in a very peculiar way. So, from the special theory of relativity, we know that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, or communicate faster than the speed of light. And if you look at Newton's theory of gravity, the forces act instantaneously, which means it is beyond the speed of light. So we know something is not really right with Newton's uh, theory of gravity. And because of that, Einstein thought about it for another 10 years and formulated a new theory of gravity, a revised or an updated version of the theory of gravity. And this theory of gravity is called the general theory of relativity. Why general and why special early on? Special, we were just talking about things that moved at constant speeds, whereby space-time was flat. I'll explain what this means. And then, if you incorporate accelerations, whereby speed is not constant, we have the general theory of relativity. So according to this general theory of relativity, which is firmly founded in the principle of equivalence, what is that? Einstein says that acceleration and gravity are equivalent. So to apply what Einstein discovered, just think of yourself in a car, and if the car turns left, for example, you would always feel like you're being pulled to the right. Okay, and vice versa, if it turns right, you would always feel like being pulled to the left. Now, according to Newton, this sensation of moving in the opposite direction to which the car is turning is because of a body's tendency to keep its original path. So if you are originally going straight, and the car turns, and you still insist on going straight, then you will feel like you're being pulled to the right. Okay, it's likewise for if you, the car was turning to the, left, uh, to, the, to the right, and then you are feeling like you're being pulled to the left. Now, according to Einstein, the right way to think about it is not in terms of this tendency of a body to go in its original path, but that if the car turns left, it means the frame of the car is accelerating towards the left. And this acceleration of the frame generates a gravitational field inside the frame, in the car, in the opposite direction. So you are really being pulled by gravity, not the fact that you are trying to stay in a straight line. 
And likewise, if the car turns right. Okay, so that is the principle of equivalence, roughly speaking. And so with that principle, he went on to formulate the general theory of relativity, and he had a new understanding of gravity. In this case, gravity is not really a force, but it's a curvature of space-time. Okay, like this. Oops, sorry. Like here, if you have a massive star and the gravitational field is very strong, you have a curvature of space-time. Initially, it was flat, but now it curves in like this. And that paths are curved near a gravitational field because they are forced to pass through a curved point in space-time. Space-time is the arena of all events, of things that happen, right? So if you have, let's say, a projectile or some kind of asteroid that's coming close to the planet here, its, its path in space-time will be curved because space-time itself is dented or curved. So that is Einstein's general theory of relativity, which links geometry of space-time with the effect of gravity. Okay, so that was the theory of things which were large, right? Gravity, planets, or black holes, as you know it, quasars, and all those things. These are things which are large. How about the theory of things which are small? So we start off with quantum mechanics, and then eventually quantum field theory. Quantum mechanics is just the physics of things of a particle that is small. And you have many particles, you have a quantum field theory. And eventually, quantum field theory matured and advanced, and we eventually had the standard model of the quantum world. And what is the standard model? The standard model tells you that in the quantum world, these are the things that we see. These are the elementary particles that make up the matter around us that we see, and also the particles which are responsible for the forces that act between matter and their interactions. Okay, so it's complicated. There's a big menu here, you know. Um, yeah, so even I can't remember everything. So they are basically on the bosons here. Now, bosons are particles which have integer spin. And what does it mean? It means that, well, spin, uh, you know, you turn it like spin one, you turn it around once, you see it once, and then spin two. You turn, it, you turn it once around, you see it twice. Okay, you see, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very abstract concept because it's in the quantum world. Things in the quantum world are very, very abstract and, 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 and interesting. Now, and these here, the fermions have integer spin. So if something is spin half, it means that you have to turn that particle twice before you see it again. Okay, so spin two means you turn it once, you see it twice. But then if it's spin half, it means you have to turn it twice to see it back again. So that's a very, uh, counterintuitive uh, concept, but that's how you actually sort of categorize or have an idea of spin. And so the fermions make up the matter, okay, and the bosons make up the particles that mediate the force and the interactions between the matter. All right, so there are three generations, and then you can see that in the atom itself, you have, of course, the electron, so you have the electron here, and then it's made up of the protons and neutrons, which are in, in the nucleus, which are made up of these up and down quarks. Now, the rest of the quarks here, the quarks are basically particles which, are, which make up matter and are mediated by the strong force. Okay, in, the, in the universe, there are four fundamental forces, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and, the, and gravity, which you can see in some sense as a force. Okay, so the, and the rest of the particles here, you, you either see them in very high energy collisions or very specific experiments. So quarks are things which are matter particles which are involved in strong interactions. The leptons here are elementary particles that are involved in weak interactions, the weak forces, okay? And these are the mediators of the forces between the particles. Now, the very interesting thing is the Higgs boson, which was recently discovered in experiments. It is this elementary, this elementary particle is a scalar, it's got spin zero, all right? Uh, which means it has no direction. In other words, it looks the same wherever you look at it. That's the meaning of a scalar. And through this thing called the Higgs mechanism, it gives masses to the particles and in some sense glues them together. For if things were massless, they would just fly off from the forces between each other. Okay, so in that sense, it's a glue of the universe. Okay, so, so we see all these interesting things here, okay, which are subatomic and we, we, we can't observe them. In, you know, uh, we have to observe them in, in experiments and or, you know, through a very, very small lens, very powerful lens. And so, so we have a theory of things which are very big, and then we have a theory of things which are very, very small. So why do we need to unify gravity, which is a theory of things which are big, with the standard model, which is a theory of things which are very small? So at the beginning of time, 
according to the Big Bang Theory, which is sort of the leading theory of cosmology today, there is no 100% proof that it is right. Okay? Uh, there have been experiments to try to detect gravitational waves, which are relics of a Big Bang. So there were some false alarms. I don't really know what the state of the question is right now, but as far as I know, there's no definitive answer to that yet. But let's just say the Big Bang theory is right. So according to the Big Bang, all of space-time was crunched into a single point at the beginning of time, here. Okay. So when all of things are crunched into a single point at the beginning of time, it would mean that, firstly, the curvature of space is huge. Right? Think about it, a ball, a sphere. If you take a sphere to be very, very small, for example, right, crunch it, or some object that's very small, the changes in its geometry are tremendous over a small space. And that means the curvature is huge. And with a very large curvature, the gravitational field is also very strong. And usually, when space-time is not crunched to a single point like that, gravity is a very weak force that we can sort of ignore when we are dealing with the theory of things which are very small. So the quantum theory of things which are very small, which gave rise to the quarks and the, the, the electrons and all those things that we saw early on, think about it. If you put a nail on a table, and you took a magnet and put it over the nail, you would see that the nail is being attracted by the magnet. But think about it, the Earth is huge. And yet the magnet, being so small, can just attract the nail. So you can see that the electromagnetic force is way stronger than the force of gravity. So in that sense, when you look at quantum theories that do not include gravity, that's okay. Because over very small scales in space-time, these forces interact more greatly than gravity. But what happens when you are at the beginning of time when space-time is all crunched to a point. Now, then something different happens because the gravitational field is extremely strong now and it becomes almost the strength of the other forces in the universe. Okay, uh, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. So to understand what happens at the beginning of time, we need a theory that unifies all the four fundamental forces and which will allow us to understand how they interact with one another. Okay? So a more intuitive understanding would also be this. If you look at the theory of gravity, it is a theory of space-time that is smooth. So if you look at the quantum world, the quantum world is not deterministic like the large world, meaning that you can't just put in some conditions in the, in the beginning and then you can predict with, with certainty what's going to happen. It's a probabilistic world. A probabilistic world that says that if you have a particle starting from A, ending at B, it doesn't go in one distinct path, but it takes an infinite number of paths that upon observation by a macroscopic you know, observer like us takes a certain path, it collapses to a certain path. So there's an infinite number of paths that it can take, which means that in the quantum world, if you look at space-time, the infinite possibilities of space-time too, right, between points A and B. That results in what we call a quantum foam, a space-time foam. So in other words, space-time is not smooth at the quantum level, but rather at a small quantum, meaning small level, rather it is made up of you know, random fluctuations like this, which means that Einstein's theory of relativity fails because it is only meant to describe space-time that is smooth. So it fails at the quantum level, which means we need a modification or a new quantum theory of gravity, a theory of gravity at small scales. And that is also why we sort of need to unify gravity with quantum field theory so that the theory of the big and the small can become one theory. So I've mentioned it earlier on, so but let's just uh, go through it again. So unification and why we need it. The strength of coupling of gravity becomes comparable to other forces at the Planck distance, which is 10 to the power minus 32 centimeters, minus 31 centimeters, around there. So gravity needs to be unified with the standard model if we wish to understand the origins of the universe. So quarks and leptons, okay, those things that we saw, quarks are the fermions which are involved in the strong interactions, and then the leptons are the ones which are involved in the weak interactions. They are different masses, and there are many charges and coupling constants in nature, like electric charge, E, Newton's gravitational constant, all of which are required as inputs by us into the standard model. Meaning that the standard model requires us to have this data from experiments, put it inside, and then you would have an answer of, say, some physical event that you, are, that you wish to predict. But there is no... So 
there is no, we do not know the reason why their values are such. So there is no fundamental theory that allows us to derive these values from scratch, from some underlying fundamental principle, right? So all masses, charges, and coming constants observed in nature should be predicted by our grand theory. This is this theory of everything that, we, that, that, of, of uni, uh, that, uh, that describes everything physical in the universe. And also, you see there are many fermions and bosons, and people think that, okay, a, a beautiful theory is one which should also unify the fermions and the bosons into a single framework. Okay, so because of these reasons, we try to seek, or humanity has tried to seek a unified theory of the standard model and gravity. So this is a sort of short history of the unification of physics. So electricity and mag magnetism and light, that from Maxwell's, we had electromagnetism. So he was able to unify the theory of, 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 of the electric field and the magnetic field which oxidate together to form light that we observe, and that's under the electromagnetic theory here. And then in some nuclear processes that we observe, like beta decay and neutrino interactions, people have tried to understand those subatomic processes and have come up with the theory of weak interactions. Sorry. So combining the theory of electromagnetism and the weak interactions, we have the electroweak theory, Meaning that now we understand how electromagnetism interacts with, say, processes like beta decay, right? Or neutrino interactions, things which are... Neutrinos are basically elementary particles which are neutral, they have no charge. And they're observed in very specific experiments. Or even through the radiation from the sun, you have neutrino particles that are being emitted from fusion, stellar fusion, and, and, and these are neutral particles, and they're very light. Um, so you have electroweak theory, which combines these two. And then on the other hand, there was also a development of the theory of strong interactions, okay, uh, which is a theory about the protons, the neutrons, and the pions. Pions are basically particles which are made up of quark and antiquark, so they are all involved in strong interactions. So, okay, maybe I didn't explain what the strong interactions are. Okay, so the strong interactions, the strong force is what keeps the protons from flying off in the neutron in the, the nucleus, okay? Because light charges repel, but the protons are all positively charged. So they should repel and fly out of the nucleus, but it doesn't. That's because the gluon, which is the particle of the strong force, is keeping them together. Okay, so that's the strong directions. And these particles, obviously, within the nucleus itself would be involved in strong directions. So, so we have this combination of these two theories to give you the electroweak theory, then we have the strong theory, and eventually these two were unified, okay, not unified by the standard model, so these three form the standard model. So we are trying to unify all three of them into what we call a grand unified theory of electroweak and strong force. Okay, electroweak and strong force here. And then, of course, we have gravity, which is the theory of things which are very large. This is sort of like the theory of things which are small. This can be large or small. And then this is definitely for large things. So we have terrestrial gravity, which is what Newton discovered, and then celestial mechanics, the motion of stars and all that, and eventually space-time. And then we've combined it with the, uh, the ideas of space-time geometry, we have universal gravitation, and eventually, okay, sorry. So these two here forms Newton's theory of gravity. And then Einstein combined this and this into GR, general theory of relativity. And so, where does string theory sit? So string theory would be a combination of this here, okay, general relativity, and the standard model, which is this and this link here, okay? So the grand unified theory here is still a theory of the quantum world. It doesn't include gravity, but it tries to unify all the forces, electromagnetic and electroweak force and the strong force into one framework, into a grand unified group, okay, grand unified symmetry, right? Okay, so we talked about, if you looked at our slide on unification, we said that, you know, an elegant theory that describes everything in nature should also unify the fermions and bosons. That gave rise to this concept of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, it has not been detected in nature yet, but it's a beautiful concept. It has many implications. It's beautiful with many mathematical implications too. So, but we don't really know if it's the right concept or not, but let's just say that this is a postulate. So, in supersymmetry, fermions and bosons are combined using the concept, uh, in, uh, are, 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 are combined into one framework whereby 
they come in pairs with equal masses. So if you if we observe supersymmetry to be a true symmetry of nature, it would mean that we would be able to find the pairs of these things. For example, the electron has a pair called this electron, and then you have a photino, which is a pair of the photon. Photon is the elementary particle of light. And then the quark that we saw just now, we have the squarks, and the gluon, which I told you is the elementary particle which mediates the strong force gluing the protons together in the nucleus, then you would have a superpartner called the glumino. So this is a boson, okay, this is a fermion, this is a boson, this is a fermion, and all these are like the fermions of bosons, the opposite. Which means that one has integer spin, the other has half integer spins. Okay, string theory to the rescue. So we need supersymmetry, we need to unify gravity with the standard model. So how does string theory fit as a prescription to do that? So before we, okay, so before we, we explain that, let me just talk a little bit about strings and why we think that this is truly the fundamental theory on nature. Now, if you look at a point particle from a distance that says goes from point A to B in space like that, this is the X coordinate, the Z coordinate, and the Y coordinate, and it goes like that. So in string theory, what the, 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 the concept is this, that Really, why we thought things were points is because we didn't look closely enough. So if we look, if we look at a point particle close enough, you know, at scales of 10 to the power of minus 31 centimeters, for example, you would see that there could be two possibilities. It could be a very small loop like that, which charted out a tube in space. Or maybe an open string, which charts out a sheet like this. In order for you to understand this concept, just think of, take a pencil, take a pencil, and on the wall, draw a very small circle. And then stand far away from that circle. What do you see? You see a point, right? Likewise, take a pencil, draw a short dash, stand far away from the wall, what do you see? Still a point. So the point is that if you look close enough, there could be extended dimensions that are invisible to you when, you, when you're looking at something from far away. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the tenet of string theory, that nature could be made up. Point particles that we observe, of course, through experiments, we have observed point particles. Those, those quarks, the leptons that we see, they're all like points to us, right? But string theory says that if you look at these things closer, more closely, at a scale that's much smaller, they're actually made up of strings, composite strings. Okay? So, now, when we assume that the elementary constituents of nature are not points, but extended objects, and we do our analysis of that quantum theory of extended objects, we will see something very nice coming out. We will see that through the quantization of such an extended object, we would be able to get the graviton. Now, the graviton is a spin-2 particle that is supposed to mediate the force of gravity at the quantum level. That's one. Number two, if you analyze the, the, the quantization of the string and use the principle that symmetries of a physical theory before quantization you know, should be preserved after quantization, you would get the equations of Einstein's general theory of relativity. In other words, the graviton would behave as what Einstein predicted, and some corrections, which come in when you look at scales which are small, when the scales are large, you actually get Einstein's theory of gravity. So starting with something that is supposed to, to describe a quantum object, a small object, you end up getting equations that we know which were formulated when things were big. So that is one very good reason for us to believe that we are at least on the right track. So therefore, string theory, so let's look at it a bit better, a bit more. So, we need a supersymmetry, so what we need is a superstring, which means that if you look at a string that's going on in space like that, it has degrees of freedom, right? It can curl up like this, it can vibrate like this, it can go in an infinite number of ways, right? So we have degrees of freedom which are bosonic, so you can understand them as just coordinates on, on the string itself in space, right? Or fermionic degrees of freedom, which means they're like coordinates, but when you take their values and you switch to space, switch them between each other, there is a minus sign that they pick up. 
so they don't commute in that sense. Okay, so 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 that's that's the thing, you know. So they, they it's, it's different from say a coordinate. So it's it's a concept that's slightly abstract, but this is how you can understand it. So it has degrees of freedom, whereby if you exchange the data, it remains the same. There's no sign. There's no sign involved. But some parts of the data, when you exchange it, there are signs involved. And so as we said, we believe that all of physical reality is made up of these strings. So, for example, let's say if an electron, if you observe something like a point, which is an electron with some negative electron charge, it will mean that it's a string that's vibrating at a certain harmonic. So if you look at strings, they can vibrate in infinite number of ways. So a certain way of vibration would manifest in large distances as a point particle with some characteristic. So that's how you understand it. Okay? So each vibration, so from seen, seen from far, each vibration of a string is equivalent to a point particle which has a certain characteristic. Of course, there are infinite possibilities of vibrations, and therefore infinite possible ways that you can generate particles which are either fermions or bosons. Okay? So this is, again, an idea of what we call a world sheet. This is called a world sheet instead of a world line. So this is, the, this is what an open string traces out in space. Time, and this is what a closed string traces out in space time. So instead of a line, you have a sheet. So, as we mentioned early on, that the geometry of space time that used the force of gravity is due to a spin 2 massless boson, right? Which string theory produces. And, and in all closed superstrings, in, in the string theory of closed strings, you will always see this massless spin 2 state or particle appear in the theory, right? So it's not just like one in a very, it's not like, you know, you see it only in a very specific condition, but it's general, it just appears generally. So very easily we can, we can see that it is, you know, quite possibly the quantum theory of gravity that we're looking for. Okay, now for extra dimensions, that some people, some of you might find this interesting. Okay, so further analysis of string theory tells us that the superstrings can exist only in 10 dimensions, which is interesting because we only know of space as three of space time as three of space and one of time. But where are the other six dimensions, you may ask? We'll explain that later on. But the point is that string theory tells you that there are actually 10 dimensions in space. And uh, okay, right. So before the superstring, just some history there was just the bosonic string, meaning that people said, okay, let's study string theory, which doesn't have fermionic degrees of freedom. In other words, you don't incorporate supersymmetry in it. And that tells you that you need 26 dimensions, okay? So that is not really what we're interested in. But the point is that, how did we derive 26 dimensions from just considering a string which had no fermionic degrees of freedom? So once again, we use the postulate, the physical postulate, that has helped us so far up to now that a symmetry that you observe of a theory before you quantize ought to be preserved upon quantization, and that gives us the dimension of 26. So it's, very, it's, it's, it's almost like that mathematically. You have a quantity that violates the symmetry given by d minus 26, d being the dimension. And then you need to set this quantity to zero so that there's no violation of that symmetry. Then d equals to 26. That's how we got it. It's very rigorous. It's not heuristic. It's not like a guess. It's all in rigorous calculations, rigorous mathematics, right? And so if you introduce fermionic degrees of freedom to the string, then you would get a slightly different equation, which is like d minus 10. And that's how we get 10 dimensions for superstrings. So in superstring theory, we know there are 10 dimensions. However, these 10 dimensions are extend these extra dimensions are extended only in the spatial directions, which means that string theory just like our usual four-dimensional space-time, has one time direction and nine spatial directions. So very interesting. Then where are the extra six spatial dimensions? We don't see them, of course, right? We don't see them. Around us is just x, y, and z, and time, three spatial dimensions. We don't see the other six extra spatial dimensions. So one theory as to why we don't see them is this. At the beginning of time, the universe was made up of of 10 loops, okay, 10 loops, actually it's 11, but let's just take 10 for now. So you have 10 loops, and one loop being time, and the other nine loops being spatial directions, that are all being curled up into a single singular point. And then there was the Big Bang. During the Big Bang, there were strings that wrapped around six of the loops, 
six dimensions. When we say 10 dimensions, we just think of it this way. We have loops which are orthogonal or perpendicular to each other in, 11, in, 10, in 10 directions. Of course, it's not something we can imagine. Our brains are only good enough for three spatial dimensions, but logically, you can extend that concept into higher dimensions. So you have strings which wrap around six spatial dimensions that did not allow these dimensions to expand. And so with the Big Bang, the other four loops could expand to form the visible universe that we see today. So why is it that we see space as being like a straight line? So if you take, for example, at any point here, you can say that if you, the x direction is just one straight line there, and then the y direction is one straight line here, and then the z direction is here. Think of a loop, and if the loop expands to become very, very large, and we are just like a very small ant on the loop, what will we see? A straight line. So that's how the, uni the visible universe forms, in that there were actually four loops which are very small that became very large, such that we see it to be straight. Being a very small entity, we see it to be straight, but if we were like some gigantic, you know, supernatural entity, you know, maybe we would be able to see, oh, it's just like four loops, like a donut, for example. Right? Donut has two loops, right? One like that and one like that. But if you end on a donut, it appears just two dimensions to you, two dimensional to you. Right? Okay, so so the six dimensions are wrapped and, and kept small, and the other four could expand to to form the visible space-time, which means, which means this, which means that at every point in space-time, if you have a microscope that could look at something that is small enough, like maybe the Planck size, 10 to the power minus 31 centimeters, you would see at that point, if you could see, of course, actual dimensions, visualize actual dimensions, that there would be six loops, or six curl up dimensions, six curl up spatial dimensions at every single point in space-time. Okay? So these were the dimensions that didn't expand. So a visual, a pictorial realization is this. This is our four-dimensional space-time, and at every point, any point, an infinite number of points, of course, any arbitrary point, you take an arbitrary point here, and then you will see that at the intersection of the x, y, and the z axis, at that intersection, you will see curled up dimensions, six curled up dimensions, which are very, very small. Now, strings being very, very small, they can access or interact with these dimensions and then manifest the properties that we actually see of the particles that we observe today. Okay, that's, of course, a hypothesis, and that, that, that is how you, know, you can get a rich, uh, such a rich spectrum of, of observations, starting from string theory. So these spaces, these spaces have to be very special, okay? They're not just some random, you know, uh, arbitrary kind of space, right? So we will try to understand what these six-dimensional spaces here, Y6, are. Okay, so these six-dimensional spaces, of course, string theory, which is supposed to describe what we observe in nature, must be such that these six-dimensional spaces have to be consistent with that, right? To describe a theory on nature that we already observe. So we know, as we saw in that table, in the standard model, we had three families of fermions, three families of matter, right? Quarks and leptons, one, two, and three. So in order for us to generate a theory in four dimensions that has three generations or three families of fermionic particles, it's realized that you have that six-dimensional cold up space has got to have a very peculiar property for mathematicians. So we're talking about topology here and some Euler characteristic. Okay. It has to have a very special property, and that property is satisfied by a class of six-dimensional manifolds called Calabi-Yau space. Calabi space. They were discovered by, of course, Calabi and Yau. Uh, technically, they are Ricci flat, so, and polynomy of SU3. So, for the mathematicians, if you want to know more, you can, we, can, we can discuss. Okay, so these are Calabi-Yau spaces, very interesting spaces that you can sort of understand them to be complicated like this, but at the same time, beautiful, many beautiful properties. So, as I mentioned, the strings can interact with these dimensions, okay? So how small, really exactly how small is a string, to just give you an example. Now, the size of the superstring is about 10 to the power minus 35 meters, which is about 10 to the power minus 33 cm, right? Um, 
and has a staggering string tension of 10 to the power of 10 to the power 39 tons. Okay, this is the mass of the string. How do you interpret such a massive object? It just means that for you to observe a string, you would have to observe um, processes whose energies are extremely high. So that's how you interpret mass in this context. Why is it related to energy? Because of E equals to mc squared. So you can see there's mass, C squared, that gives you energy from Einstein's theory of relativity. So things which are massive, you need to observe them in very high energy processes. So this means that, okay, so it means that strings can only be observed in, at very, very, very high energies, maybe even cosmic energies, energies that are beyond our colliders today, our particle colliders today. So it's this size, very, very small. So to give you sort of a flavor of how small it is, the size of a superstring is as much smaller than the atom as the atom is smaller than the size of the solar, solar system. So think about it, solar system here on Earth, and then we have the atom itself. Okay, that's the difference, right? And so the string is, is, is that much smaller from the atom. Okay, so when viewed at small enough distances, all elementary particles, like in this case you can see perhaps you know, a, a proton here that's made up of two up quarks and a down quark, Okay, all elementary particles, when seen very closely, can be seen to be made up of strings, like that. So as you mentioned, things which look like points from a far distance could, when you come closer, look like extended objects. Okay? So then, how does something so small connect to the observed world? I mean, I mean, it's so small, so how can we even observe the effects of string theory? I need to at least know that we're on the right track. Okay, so in string theory itself, there are, you see, the string can vibrate in an infinite number of ways. Now, if you look at its least lowest energy vibrations, or what we call the master states of the string, right? Now, these are the ones which can be observed. So from far, they always look like point particles anyway. So let's just look at a string that is at its lowest vibrational mode, which from far is still seen as a point particle, but because it is its vibrational modes are low enough, it means the energy is low enough, which means it's not as massive, which means that you can detect it in experiments or processes which are not very high energies or energies which are, which are reachable by our current technology, right? So the lowest vibrations, the massless vibrations of strings will then give you the observed particles that we see today, okay? So, yeah. So these massless particles, these massless vibrations, for example, the photon, photon is something obviously we can even see it now. I mean, it's light, right? Of course, we can't see the photons, but we know the theory of, of, of the particle wave duality of light, which you can test out. So that arises from an open strings, an open string at its lowest vibrational mode. So we can observe it. Okay, that's the photon. And these particles, being massless, they can travel far, and can mediate forces which are also very far, just like light, can travel on forever. If there are no disturbances, no things to be reflected off, no dust, nothing, we can always see light from distant galaxies. I, in, indeed, we do. In cosmology, we are looking at things which are, you know, from a long, long time ago, because it took light such a long time to reach us, right? But the point is that it could travel a far, far distance. Okay, so, so much for string theory, and let's go on to say more about it. So from our analysis of this, 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 extended object. We realize that there are actually, there's actually not one string theory, but several string theories which are consistent. Right? So, so, so people used to say this, an embarrassment of riches, because we're supposed to find a unified theory of everything, and then we end up getting so many theories. So in a way, you know, it's interesting that there's so you see, in a way, it sort of means that, okay, we are still very far from finding that single unified theory, but it also means that it is it is more fun to play with, right? So let's just look at all the string theories that we have. So we have theory of closed strings given by these types of strings here and then open strings. So you can see there's two and one. The one and two just means, for the people who are familiar, different amounts of supersymmetry in 10 dimensions. And for the layperson or the non-scientific person, it would just mean how, how well the fermions and bosons are connected you know, in 10 dimensions. When it's n equals to two, it means they're extremely well connected, okay? And n equals to one, still connected, but not as extremely connected as n equals to two. But 
even though there was an embarrassment of riches, there was this thing called the second superstring revolution. So those five string theories that we saw earlier on were discovered in the 80s. And then in the mid 90s, it was found that these five string theories here are actually different limits of a single, unique 11 dimensional theory. So this is what we call M theory. So M theory was discovered by Witten. So he found that different limits of the five string theories are actually, the, the origin is M theory in 11 dimensions. And there's this sixth lick here called 11 dimensional supergravity. 11 dimensional supergravity is just the point particle limit of M theory. So if you look at M theory, in M theory in 11 dimensions, if you look at things far away, then you will see a quantum field theory of points, which is 11 dimensional supergravity. Okay, so we put it here because this is also one theory that has been, I won't say studied to death, but it was sort of the leading theory, leading unified theory of everything in the late 70s, early 80s. So we, we put it here because it's an important development in theoretical physics. So you can see that even though we had an embarrassment of riches, eventually we saw that there was a single unifying framework called M-theory. And how does it connect? So you see this dizzying array of dualities. I mean, for us who are familiar, okay, that's fine. But for those of you who aren't, it just looks like arrows everywhere, you know. But the point is this, you have 11-dimensional M-theory sitting here, and you can see that these arrows connect, you know. M connects M theory to these theories, and these theories can connect to each other in lower dimensions. So as we go down in dimension, it means this. On, in 11 dimensions, if you take one of the 11 dimensions to be a circle, so that at far distances, it seems to disappear. If you take, it, you take something to be a small circle, at long distances, you, you don't see that circle, and it looks like 10 dimensions, then you end up getting these string theories. And in 10 dimensions, if you take another circle, then you will get these nine dimensional theories, uh, you know, which descend from, from these theories here that can then be related to each other depending on the size of the circle. Okay, so these dualities are either what we call S-dualities, whereby the theories are related to each other but with a different coupling constant, meaning the strength of interaction is the inverse of the other. So you have a strong, strongly coupled theory whereby interactions are very strong. It's equivalent to a weakly coupled theory and so on. And, the, and if you look at T-duality, which is between this and this, it means that if you compactify, take one of the directions to be a circle, then that theory is dual to the other theory on a circle, but a circle whose size is the inverse. So these are called S and T dualities. Now, what then is this F theory that's 12 dimensional? So F theory is not really a physical theory. It's just an auxiliary theory to actually study this type 2B string. Because within the type 2B string, there is a set of symmetries that it obeys. It's the modular symmetry of the SL2Z group. And that's a geometrical symmetry of a torus. So for mathematicians, you would understand what I'm talking about. And so how people came out with F-theory is to say, is to formulate a torus vibration over the 10 dimensions so that at every point in space-time, you can encode the data, the modular data in the torus that sits above the 10 dimensions. Okay, so, so, so for mathematicians, this is how you understand F-theory. I won't say this more because it's technical. So in string theory, instead of Points like that scattering, you end up getting you know, tubes like that scattering. Okay, so these are, are, these are diagrams, Feynman diagrams of scattering event diagrams uh, in particle physics, which before we talked about points, but in strings, you, know, you, you see that they are replaced by tubes. There is a problem in quantum field theory, and it has got to do with the fact that when you try to compute scattering events in quantum field theory, they, let me just fix this once and for all. Okay, they'll give you infinities, the answers. Okay. Yeah, so you have to renormalize, meaning use a, a trick to sort of get finite answers in quantum field theory. And that the reason for such a problem is because in quantum field theory, you know, these points meet. So you have in the mathematical equation something that divides over the distance between the points. And you can see that where they meet, the distance is zero. Anything divided by zero is an infinite number. So it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. So people have to use tricks to sort of overcome that to get a finite answer. So that's called renormalization in quantum field theory. 
But you can see that in string theory, this never happens because of the extended dimensions. There is not a single point which really meets at any point in space. So in that sense, you know, we don't have the infinities that you see in quantum field theory. That gives us further encouragement that we are on the right track by assuming that something has ex extended dimensions instead of just points. Okay, so strings, are they the only objects in string theory? So we have generalized our theory of points to extended strings. Is it possible that objects of higher dimensions also exist? The answer is yes. Okay, the answer is yes. So in string theory, we have what we call brains. Brains are higher dimensional extensions of the strings. They could be like a two brain, three brain. So a membrane, for example, is, is a two brain, which sweeps out a world volume. So instead of a sheet, a two-membrane, two as it travels in space, it sweeps out a cube. So it's a world volume, okay? And then higher dimensions would be world volumes too of higher dimensional spaces, higher dimensional subspace, subspaces. So on these brains, on these end brains, open strings can end. Remember, we have strings which are closed and open. So open strings can end on them in such a manner like this. Okay, so how do we understand this? Uh, how do we understand the interaction of brains and strings in, in string theory? So just imagine in type 2A string, if you remember, we have brains, type 2B, we have brains also. They're called D brains, actually. The D just, is just a technical term for a certain boundary condition. So the point is that if you have these brains in the theory of closed strings, like type 2A and type 2B, you can see that as the closed strings come near the brain, they can break up and form open strings. Okay, because that's energetically more favorable. So they can become uh, open strings and the endpoints will lie on the open strings. And in a similar manner, the open strings which are now residing on the brains can actually coalesce and become closed strings again and be emitted out by the brain. Okay, so you see an interaction between closed strings, the brains, and how they open up to become open strings and then close back up again to become closed strings, right? So not only can you have strings which end on brains or between brains, you can have strings which end between brains. You can also have brains ending on brains, like that. Okay, so you have brains ending on brains. There are some uh, phenomenological models of the universe which require such a construction. So we won't talk about that here, but these are the possible configurations that you can uh, find in string theory. So this is the menu of brains that we find in string theory. So for those of you who are wondering how do you even deduce that such things were possible, well, physically, technically, it means this. You look at the Lagrangian for the physical model, and you realize that in the Lagrangian itself, there are potentials which are of a higher degree. Just like the point particle charges the one form potential, the gauge potential A mu, and then which gives you a field strength F mu B. So you have potentials which are like a mu v, a mu v lambda. So you have potentials which are of a higher numbers in, in the, the tensorial index, which tells you that they are sourced by objects which are not points, but of a higher dimension. Okay, so that's how people deduce that there were these solitonic objects, which were of a higher dimension and were also charged in the sense of a gauge field. Okay, so that's, that's the physical technical explanation, but the point is we have this you know, dizzying array of brains here, and in M theory, we have two very unique brains, the M2 brain and the M5 brain. These are all D brains. D brains meaning they have a certain, there's a certain boundary condition on the strings that end on them. The M brains are not D brains. In other words, the strings that end on them can sort of, you know, go in any arbitrary way that, that they like, okay? So the interesting thing is this, that remember that our sixth space was formed that extra six space was a very small space that we can't see, right? But these brains like strings, they can actually wrap that six space and then manifest as some physical property of the four space that we see. That's how this can happen. And an interesting model whereby the six space is actually not small. So we, we assume that the six space was small, but it could be that the six space was not small. This is not settled yet. And in a model whereby the six space is not small, our universe is actually believed the three spatial dimensions that we see now are actually believed to be the three spatial dimensions of a brain. In other words, we live in a very big brain, a D3 brain. See, that's in type 2B theory of a D3 brain. So we're living in a brain. So this world is it's a brain world. It's very interesting. 
it accounts for why gravity is such a weak force compared to magnetism, for example. Okay, we'll, we'll understand this a bit better in string theory and cosmology. Okay, so let's go to the cosmological implications of string theory now. So, as I said, the six dimensions could be small, it could be large, we don't know yet. Let's just assume that the six dimensions are not small, that it's actually large. So what happens? What happens? When the six dimensions are large and not small, there is a theory which tells us that we are actually living in a D3 brain, a tree brain, with three spatial directions. But there are many parallel copies of these worlds. So it's a many worlds kind of thing. So there are parallel copies of these, these, these brains here, and we are living in one of them. Okay? And of course, there are strings that can attach to itself, and these strings appear as the point particles that we observe, because there are points here like that. So this is one theory whereby the six dimensions are large. This is one plausible theory. And so this theory explains to us why gravity is such a weak force compared to the other forces. So as we know, we saw early on in string theory that the graviton, the quantum particle that mediates the force of gravity, are made up of closed strings. So we know that this is the 10 dimensional space, then this is the base space in which we live in. So we feel gravity living inside here, of course, right? But it's weak. Why is it weak compared to the other forces? Because the source of the gravitational effect actually comes from closed strings which are outside the brain. Remember, once it reaches the brain, you know, it breaks up and becomes an open string. Okay? So gravitational, the gravitons which are carried by the closed strings are actually living outside the brain, but upon contact with the brain, some of them penetrate through the brain, some of them break up and become open strings. So you can see that it's a, sort of like a filtration of, of, of closed strings. Not everyone gets through, so there are very few closed strings that get inside the brain, and this explains why gravity as a force is so weak compared to the other forces. Okay? So you can see that there is this sort of uh, graph here that tells you, you know, from, from closed strings which are emitted from this brain, and then the probability of, 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 uh, of finding a graviton that's still close, a uh, closed string mode that's still close, just falls like that which explains why gravity is weak. Another theory is that, okay, so in this theory, their six spatial dimensions are still small, but this theory lies in the M theory. So that's the mother theory, which is 11 dimensional. So in this theory, the 11 dimensions, if have been postulated to take this form, that it is an interval across the four space that we see across the six very small dimensions, okay? So since there's an interval, it means there can be a boundary at the interval. The boundary at the interval is 10 dimensional, and that's the cosmic brain that we're talking about. Now we live in that cosmic brain, and there is a companion brain, just one parallel brain on the other end, and then we have this thing called the cosmic brain scenario, okay? So this cosmic brain scenario results in what we call a cyclic universe which has no inflation because the space that we are living in, the visible universe, is that of the size of a brain. It doesn't go smaller, it doesn't go bigger, okay, and it has no beginning or end. Let us see this a bit more clearly. So as we said, we have these two brains that are 10 dimensional that we live inside them and then you can see from this potential function that they come close and then they hit each other and then they go off again. So this is what really happens in the colliding brain scenario. So we have a flat, empty universe, nothing in the beginning. And then there's an attraction because these two brains are very close to each other where the gravitational, gravitational field strength is strong. And so there's a force of attraction. And this force of attraction causes these brains to ripple, to, right? Because to deform. And then it hits each other. And that's where we, in this living in this brain, observe the Big Bang. So what we observe as a Big Bang was actually a, coll a collision of brains. And then, this, after this collision, they go apart, and then so the early universe starts to cool down, and then there's cosmic expansion. So all these things here from the Big Bang and the early universe and all these things which we observe in cosmology are consistent with this model. And then we have the current universe of the state of things like this. And then this is the phase whereby there is repulsion again, okay? So it's like, Okay, and then there's repulsion, which we understand today as dark energy, which then evens out the ripples and becomes a flat universe again. And then the whole thing starts again. Okay, so 
It collides, goes apart, forms the universe that we see today, and then further repulsion because of dark energy, and then flattens out, and then it comes together again. Okay, so, so that's how this cosmic universe works. If you compare with the idea of a Big Bang, so the singularity in the cyclic universe is less severe than in the Big Bang, right? The singularity, because only one dimension of space comes to a single point, not, all, not four in the case of the Big Bang, right? Or even ten. So that means that unlike the Big Bang, okay, the singularity is the, the this, this collapse is not, not as great, okay? Um, so, which means what? So the collision temperature is finite, okay? While the Big Bang has an infinite temperature at time t equals to zero, which therefore means that unlike in the case of the Big Bang, there are no exotic relics in this cyclic theory. Since the temperature of the singularity is not high enough, to produce, to condense monopoles, and even form primordial black holes. So we can sort of, what this means is that we can sort of test out which is correct, because there are distinct differences between this and the Big Bang Theory. Okay, so to summarize, I'm running short of time, the most interesting part is, okay, so, uh, so to summarize, we have, we have explained this. So we have gravity here, and cosmology, and then we end up, through string theory, understanding it as colliding brains, and then Strings, we had open brains, open strings, closed strings, which can end on brains, and then we have this, and then from the standard model, we had super strings, and, and sort of this summarizes what we have said so far. Okay? Okay, so now, this part. String theory and mathematics. I see some mathematicians here. Okay, so this is probably the, the part you're most interested in. Okay. So, string mathematics. What is string mathematics? So research in string theory and its related supersymmetric quantum field theories, okay, so within the brain itself lives a supersymmetric quantum field theory. Remember, the open strings end on the brain and they are observed as points in the brain. So that's a theory of points, quantum field theory. Okay? So if you look at the theories inside the brains and even in 10-dimensional or 11-dimensional string theory, you will see that it has invigorated and expanded fields in pure mathematics such as algebraic geometry, differential geometry, algebraic and geometric topology, number theory, representation theory, and integrable systems, or solutions of partial differential equations. Right? So, and this, this sort of, in, this, this sort of uh, interaction is, is through an emerging third discipline which we call string mathematics. It's a third discipline because it's not really pure mathematics, neither is it the physics that we are using to solve the real world because highly supersymmetric theories are known not to be connected to real physics. But so in that sense, it's like a third discipline, but it's extremely interesting. So let me just go on. Okay, so we see that it interacts with all these fields. So how does it interact with all these fields? Let us just uh, explain or summarize the results that we know about string theory and its interactions, say, with algebraic or differential geometry. So there is this concept or this topic of mirror symmetry of Calabial spaces, remember the six-dimensional spaces that were very small? So we're studying that in string theory. So there's a field called mirror symmetry, which was born out of physics, actually, uh, which tells you that the certain topological characteristics of these spaces have a, have, have, have a pair, a mirror, in a sense. If you look at the Hodge number, the Hodge diamond, it's, in, it's inflected, it's reflected. For mathematicians, if you, if, you, if you are working in this area, you know what I'm talking about. So how did this come about in string theory? So in string theory, it just says that, okay, so if you look at the string and you quantize it, and you realize that you know, on the world sheet, there are some symmetries uh, of the world sheet, and, of, and, and from these symmetries, it tells you that the ambient space in which the string is propagating in can be replaced by a mirror, and the physics will be the same. Okay, so Technically, it just means automorphism or world sheet superconformal algebra, so I, I, I won't go into that. And then quantum cohomology and gromov witten invariance. Quantum cohomology is just a deformation of classical cohomology. So instead of usual intersection cycles that give you some value, you have a deformation that uh, detracts it from the usual value, and that's quantum cohomology. Uh, it is actually you know, a ring that's defined uh, over differential forms in the modelized space of holomorphic maps into an uh, algebraic variety. So that's, that's quantum cohomology. And gromov witten invariance uh, are, are things which are related in, 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 in to those differential forms. And this study here, again, comes from the physical observation of Walsh instanton effects in topological string scattering. 
Okay, I'm running short of time, so I can't explain. I, I could explain all these things in a very layperson kind of way. I could, but we are running short of time. So let's just, uh, let's just carry on. Donaldson-Thomas theory being equivalent to Gromov-Witten theory. So Donaldson-Thomas theory is a higher dimensional generalization of Donaldson theory. So you're basically studying solutions of self-dual connections from four manifolds to six manifolds or algebraic varieties like Calabi spaces, which eventually ends up meaning they are counting torsion-free sheaths on a scheme. Okay, so that, that is Donaldson Thomas theory. gromov witten theory is about the number of holomorphic curves that you can insert into an algebraic variety. So, okay, and, and that's got to do with counting bound states of D0, D2, D6 brains in Calabi L via topological st string theory. And then generalize homological mirror symmetry. So we saw mirror symmetry here, and then we have this, this thing here. So homological mirror symmetry is just a generalization of mirror symmetry to include objects, in particular, the Fukaya category of Lagrangian submanifolds and the derived category of coherent sheaves on one side. Okay, that was formulated by Konsevich. But you can also extend that to generalized geometries, meaning calabi which are which have fluxes turned on, meaning that they can they are calabi which can have both kinds of submanifolds, both coherent sheaves and Lagrangian submanifolds, and that's in generalized homological mirror symmetry. And they were a result of studying brains in topological strings with fluxes turned on. Okay, and then of course non-commutative geometry, which is the geometry of coordinates that do not commute, meaning that if you switch x and y, you get a minus sign, that kind of thing. So this start, this idea of non-commutative geometry also ties in very nicely with D brains. Because the position of D brains when you swap them picks up a minus sign. That is the interesting thing. Okay, minus sign or, or they, they give you something else, right? So it's non commutative in that sense. How about algebraic geometry and topology? So elliptic cohomology. Okay, so I, I'm running short of time. I'm sorry, so so, but the point is that uh, for those of you who, who work on this, you probably would know what I'm talking about. K theory, classification of vector bundles, differential cohomology, a more refined version of cohomology that gives you final invariance starting with the Deligne cohomology, and that's from anomaly cancellation and string theories. Kovanov and not homologies. No, not homologies are topological invariance of knots in some spaces. Kovanov homology is just a categorification of these non invariance, meaning that you assign to these non invariance a Hilbert space of states which you can compute through its trace or the character, the not invariant itself. Okay, and then super Riemann surfaces. Riemann surfaces are just two-dimensional surfaces that have a conformal symmetry. When it's super, it means you just formulate them into super space with Grassmannian and normal coordinates. Automorphic forms, basically they are some expansions of some variables which are neatly tied in with number theory. Okay, you can see that they are related to black holes and the state counting, the entropy of black holes. That's the most interesting part, the entropy of black holes. All right, the horizon of the black holes, the event horizon. So then we have automorphic forms and toroidal Lie algebras. Um, the Riemann hypothesis comes in too. Okay, Riemann hypothesis is a hypothesis about the distribution of prime numbers, numbers which can only be divided by themselves. And then generalized katz moody algebras. Um, these are basically algebras, okay, so some relations of things which are extremely complicated. And then monstrous moonshine. Now moonshine is, 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 uh, is monstrous moonshine is a conjecture that relates the monster group two modular functions. You see that also in string theory. And then geometric Langlands. Okay, so, so this is what I do. Um, and W algebra and blah, 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 and more and more and more. Okay, so, so just too much. Okay, so anyway, the point is this. Clearly, we, have, we see a revival in the deep relationship between physics and mathematics, first seeded by Isaac Newton, who himself discovered the mathematics of calculus through an attempt to understand the physics of motion. Okay? So this has led to serious attempts by an increasing number of leading mathematicians to learn the physics of string theory. So people like, prominent examples include Fuse Medalist, Konsevich, Okonyokov, Yao himself, and even the Lee. So I've, I've interacted with all these people and, and they, they've been, we've been talking about string theory and they've been trying to learn string theory. So it is for this reason that string mathematics has lately been dubbed the calculus of the future. Okay, so it's a very exciting time for for string theorists and mathematicians, now there's a symbiosis of these two fields, and I think there's a, there's a great potential and future ahead. Now, this part, string theory and religion, okay. Now, string theory and the creator. So, cutting-edge analysis of the original model where the six dimensions were small 
show that there is not one but a plethora of universes which can exist. Okay, so the irony is this. We are trying to seek a unified theory of everything and we end up getting you know, a, a solution which has an infinite number of solutions you know, of, of universes. Right? And this is termed the string landscape. This is very controversial because people are saying you're deviating from science. It's, it's, it's a pseudoscience now because you're supposed to, to find a unique theory and now you're saying that you can't find a unique theory and that you have a theory of, 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 of so many solutions, so many possibilities. So is it even right? Is the theory even right? Okay, the point is we really don't know. Okay, but let's just see, let's just say if this was right. I really don't know, but let's just say if this was right. Nature doesn't behave in the way we want it to be. For all you know, this is right. This is how nature behaves. We don't know, right? It's not nice, it's ugly, but maybe it is the way nature behaves. So let's just say this is right, which means what? Okay, so we have an infinite, or not infinite, 10 to the power of 500 possible universes, and we live in a very special one whose conditions, like the charge of electron and this and that, were so fine-tuned that life could actually exist. Okay, intelligent beings like us could exist, who can therefore stand here today to tell you about this. Okay, so, so in some sense, you know, that, but it's a very special universe, one, one out of the many very special universes. Okay, so today there isn't a scientific explanation as to how these very special conditions arise and thus, and thus why we exist. Like we still cannot derive, for example, the mass of the electron from string theory. We can't do that. So we can measure it, but we can't derive it. You know? And it's all these delicate constants that we see in nature that allows for life to exist. So we, can't, we have not been able to find a way to derive them from a fundamental principle. So. Therefore, in this framework of the string landscape, we are coerced into accepting the concept of intelligent design. Okay? The idea that everything is deliberately fine-tuned to support the existence of life. And hence, we are coerced into accepting the idea of a creator behind it. Of course, the creator is in the most general sense. Some of you may interpret it as God, but some of you may interpret it as an ultimate science behind intelligent design. But nevertheless, something which results or produces or starts intelligent design. Okay, so we mean that. How about reincarnation? Okay, let's look at this. So on the other hand, if the six small six dimensions are not small, but they're large, okay? The six central dimensions are large, and we'll have a brain world model with possibly many parallel worlds, which life can also exist. Right, the gravitons inside and all that, and the model is inside. Okay, so we have all these parallel worlds where life can also exist. Then, metaphysically, so we're out of physics now, metaphysically, metaphysically speaking, if we view the soul as an energy source, I mean, that's scientifically plausible, right? We need energy to operate the body. If you're, if you're dead, then, then where's the energy, right? It's scientifically plausible that upon death, this energy source can access the extra six dimensions that were outside the brain, okay? Outside our brain world and jump into another parallel brain world that's also conducive for life. So in this sense, the brain world's theory lends support to the idea of reincarnation or life after death, okay? You, are, you, are, you, have, an ex you have an access to something else which is conducive for life, okay? So of course, it's a far-fetched idea, but nevertheless, an interesting one. How about string theory in the Hindu universe? The Vedas, or the Puranas, which underlies Hinduism and therefore Buddhism, states that the universe undergoes continuous cycles of big bangs and big crunches over a time span of 8.64 billion years or infinitely. Okay, so Vedas says finite time, Puranas says infinitely, but the point is that you have cycles of big bangs and big crunches. And the Veda says that there is only one universe. The Puranas asserts that there are many universes. Okay? So let's compare with our theories. So our cyclic universe theory of colliding cosmic brains in M theory asserts that the universe and its soul companion undergo infinite cycles of big bangs and big crunches. So there's an intersection of ideas here with you know, the, the, the ideas of Hindu cosmology. Okay? Not exactly, but you see parts of Vedas, parts of Puranas. So in our brain world's theory, there are neither big bangs, big crunches, nor start or end of time. They were just there, okay? But possibly many parallel worlds where life can also exist. Okay, so keep that as a thought. Now, string theory and the biblical universe. So the Torah, which underlies Judaism and therefore Christianity, Catholicism, and Islam, 
states that the universe undergoes a single Big Bang and a crunch. Now, neither our cyclic universe nor brain world's theory is compatible with this single occurrence of a Big Bang and a crunch. However, in the string landscape, right, the string landscape model, we will observe such a single occurrence, at least from the viewpoint of that universe that we inhabit. It's got to do with the transition of the vacuum amplitude. Okay, so, so it means that so a Big Bang happens because yeah, there's a transition to that universe. Okay, so clearly the different models in string theory either reinforce or counter various fundamental beliefs of the main religions present in the world today. It's still not known which is the correct model of string theory as we haven't yet fully understood string theory. What do we mean by this? From Einstein's theory of gravity, there was the equivalence principle. Quantum mechanics, you have the uncertainty principle. But in string theory, what is the principle? We don't know. <laughs> We've discovered string theory from top down. That's, that's the problem. We discovered it by accident, so we do not know the underlying fundamental principle that supports the entire framework of string theory, or rather, the symmetry of string theory. We don't know what that is, okay? We just know that it's a very rich theory. We're scratching the surface and finding many interesting things that connect to cosmology, com connect to mathematics, but what is that underlying principle which sources the whole framework? We don't know, which supports the whole framework? We don't know. Nevertheless, it is clear that string theory, once we fully understand this, would allow us to know which of these beliefs are true, false, or need to be modified, and thus, string theory in this sense plays a pivotal role in the future of religion. In case you were lost along the way, let's summarize, okay, just in case you're lost along the way. Okay, so string theory is a leading candidate for the theory of everything in physics. There are other candidates too, non-commutative geometry, loop quantum gravity, String theory remains to be fully understood. Due to technological limitations, string theory has not yet been experimentally verified to any extent. String theory is also a source of inspiration and ideas in current and future mathematics. String theory, when fully understood, has significant implications on theology and therefore religion. Just as the Buddhist and biblical scriptures were the supreme knowledge of nature some 2,000 years ago, so is string theory today, possibly the religion of the future. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay, uh, we thank Professor Tan for a very interesting brain talk, and I hope that your brains are still intact. And okay, in the interest of time, maybe we can take two questions for Professor Tan. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, please. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I mean, you, you can see this. Sorry, I don't know what? I mean, like, without super, uh, without super, um, super symmetry, right, you don't get basically a number confirmation. That's right, that's right. So the theory will fail if supersymmetry is not found or is proven to be not part of nature. Yes. So it, le it rests squarely on supersymmetry. Yeah. So because the bosonic string itself is not rich enough to give the things that you see of the world today. So it has to, supersymmetry has to exist for string theory to be right, as a, as a theory of nature. But so I, even if it's not, for example, all the connections that we see in mathematics come from supersymmetries that are higher, meaning that lots of supersymmetries, quantum field theories that have like n equals to four supersymmetries. So those things are obviously not realistic to nature because in my opinion, even as a string theorist, I don't, I don't see how you can connect uh, a theory that has n equals to four supersymmetry with nature. n equals to one is our best bet. Then you break it spontaneously, like the way gate symmetries are being broken, to get a theory which you to get a theory of nature at this energy scale, which you don't see supersymmetry, but maybe at high energies you can see it. So um, yeah, so it has to be there for us to know that string theory is a correct theory of nature. Yes, but even if my, of course, this is my my sort of biased opinion, uh, but. Very objectively, a theory which has so many connections to something, to fields which are almost different from, from, in, from a different footing, like for example, mathematics. If you derive something in, in, in math, like A equals to B, it was derived in a very, very different way, right? It's just rigorous, very technical. Math is an exact science. So to me, math is like the lab that we are lacking now. 
because it is an exact science. So the next thing we can look for is the mathematics. So if mathematics says that A equals to B is rigorously proved, and we have a physical system, like say through energy conservation, we get A equals to B, then we can say that our concept of energy conservation in this system can be corroborated with something that was exact. Maybe not nature, but then proved in an exact way. So my point is this, there are many such connections in string theory with mathematics in particular and exact science. So I do not believe that this framework is entirely wrong, okay? I believe that it will describe a theory of nature, but it is not in its most correct form yet. Yeah. So, but back to your question, yes, supersymmetry is vital. Yes. Okay, and uh, any other question? One more? Yeah, Can you yeah please. Okay, the first question, right? So you talk about experiments, which is similar to what he asked. Okay, so if you look at the size of the string, very small, right, 10 to about 35 meters. So the experiments that can probe such small distances would involve collisions that are extremely powerful. So at present, technologically, there's a limitation on how much energy we can, engine, uh, we can, we can put into a collider. And so it's gonna be difficult to observe them at least indirectly, maybe some effects of string theory indirectly, through particle physics, maybe we can observe them. Supersymmetry is a good bet. Supersymmetry is, 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 is a framework of string theory which can also be applied to quantum field theories, meaning that we can, we can, we can still, uh, we have physical theories of point particles, not strings, that are supersymmetric. So if these theories are found to be correct or observed in nature, then it would imply that if you look more closely, then these are superstrings. So indirectly, there's a way. Maybe through cosmic occurrences, like you know, some, some, some explosion in, in space, in outer space, whereby energies are very high, there could be an indirect way that we can actually observe the effects or the consequences of string theory. So that is the first question, okay? So the second question, what you must do uh, to be a string theorist from, from, from where I came from. Of course, you have to go back to school. NUS was, was very nice. They had a part-time PhD program. Uh, in 2003, I remember this. I took a master's by coursework in 2001 in NUS. I was working for the military then. I was, I was, I was a major in the Air Force. And my, I had my staff tour. I mean, for, for officers in the military, you have different tours. And my staff tour was in Mindef, which is Bukit Gombak. In other words, I had a very regular office uh, schedule, which allowed me to do a part-time study. So in 2003, they offered a part-time PhD program. I took that, so I had to go back to school. That's for sure, you have to go back to school. The transition from studying engineering to physics was a very difficult one. I must admit it was very difficult. But on the other hand, so I did electrical engineering, okay? Of all the engineering, uh, of all the different branches of engineering, I think it, if you were an electrical engineer, it's probably, it's probably easiest for an electrical engineer to transition to do theoretical physics. The reason being because in electrical engineering, you already deal or you learn many sophisticated types of mathematics. Hubert spaces were things that we even used uh, for communications engineering, for example, right? Digital comms requires you to study Hilbert spaces. So these things were not totally alien to me, and therefore when I learned quantum mechanics and all that, it wasn't really totally alien to me either. So that made the transition easier, but nevertheless, it's still a very different thing, looking at circuits and it's still very different, okay? Um, but that said, having done a part-time PhD, uh, as I've always told my PhD students, I had the security of a job that paid me pretty well, okay? And I didn't have the constraint of time. So I could you know, do a part-time PhD over seven years, I think that would be fine as long as you pay fees. So in a way, <laughs> in a way the, 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 iron, the ironic thing is that in, a, in doing a thesis, okay, to do good work, you must be able to think without any stress. Because when you're stressed out and you're forced to produce papers, you probably won't produce very good work, especially in theory. Okay, probably same in mathematics, same thing, you know, theoretical, sciences, you know, you, you know. But on the other hand, you know, so, 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 it's like that. I always tell my students, you know, you are in a very difficult situation. You have four years to do your thesis, so, you know, and then, you know, living off a stipend, you know, and so, you know, you, 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 to do good work, you mustn't, you know, mustn't hurry yourself, but at the same time, you've got to hurry in case, you know,